Hi, I am Katerina Dimitrievich, A.K. Crowdy, and I'm from Lapro University, UK. Hi, I'm Seda Ustetin, PhD student at EMEA Institute of Design in Sweden. Um, hi, my name's Jo Berry. Um, I work at Loughborough University as well. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Peter Stoiko. Um, I'm, uh, I run something called the System Viz Project. It's kind of a side project, but I normally work as a, a system design lead and information designer at the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. I'm here in Ottawa. Wonderful. Uh, and also, just so you all know, oh, Ellen oh, Sally, yes. Do you want me to introduce myself? Please, yes, sorry. Hi. So yeah, my name's Sally Sutherland. I'm the commenter, hopefully, as long as I don't start coughing too much. Um, and I'm from the University of Brighton and I'm involved in a research group there called Radical Methodologies. Thanks. And just so you all know, we're lucky to, to have Aditi here who's doing the some of the graphic recording in the background, which is just, um, oh, anyway, one of the, I'm, it's like always one of the, the kind of delights for me, like the after party seeing um, the graphic recordings that happen afterwards. Uh, okay, so I think if we are ready to start, so Katerina, if you wanna kick it off, please take it away and we'll have five minutes for Katerina's and then we'll move on to the next. So as I said, I come from Labra University School of Design and Creative Arts. Um, as you can see on screen, I will be unpacking a series of site-specific installations. This one particular one deals with um, systemic um, um, view or unmap systemic ways of looking at plastic entanglement in nature. So, okay. So the plastic entanglement is a visual narrative with the single use plastics. And it sets as exploration of my own self-ethnographic plastic waste engagement that visually critiques plastic pollution in nature. This is a presumer installation that mediates material relations between plastic and nature. And this was the first site specific installation called Tree Without a Cure. They have started doing or weaving through um, during the COVID-19 lockdown. So saying this, the very generic background, um, is to the Anthropocene is, is that the fact is that we live in a plastic debris era. And from the individual perspective, it is really challenging to visualize the extent of plastic pollution due, due to proximity, the planetary ways of entanglement and multiplicity of scale. Particularly um, when I talk about multiplicity of scale, I relate to oceanic spaces and oceanic depths as well. So as Crowley Praxis aims is promoting designing with single use packaging um, through the reuse activities and participation and forging a certain novel waste relations and nudging towards behavior change. So this in the background, we are having this transposition of nomadic transposition of installation that becomes a plastic entanglement, but it's been transported to the different side of the UK to the left borough. So this is the background, although it's unmapped story, there's a bit of a theoretical mapping in the background that supports this multiplicities of conversations that integrates the uh, craftivism, the political art and DIY, and also social design activism that are heavily theoretically infused and entangled with notions of positive waste, which are borrowed from Kennedy, new materiality from Rosa Brazzotti's, and the feminist science, particularly looking at the Max uh, Liberoin work. In the background, you have this crossover of experiencing notions of nearness and relation, uh, some Heideggerian notions or Bill Brown's think theory um, and relations of when the plastic object becomes an artifact, conversational artifact or a plastic thing, as I like to call it in my design languaging. So, the plastic entanglement also visually explores through DIY, craft tactics, and the single-use plastics, and 
really promotes and highlights the staggering 32% to be lost to the environment um, data by the World Economic Forum, uh, emphasized by Ekin Johansson, and practice therefore visualizes or extrapolates this data of mismanaged plastic waste, um, which is entangled and omnipresent in nature. Uh, and this is one of the continuing installations in 2022 uh, of I planted a plastic in my garden um, and also kind of promotes um, of how much of the plastic um, is part of the planetary embodiment uh, through the feminist materiality. Obviously coming back to the site specific installation, which was part of the temporary short installation of RSD 12 at Loughborough Hub where I reuse some of my, perpetually reuse some of my artifacts of conversational artifacts of the XMAS. Uh, and through this hands-on participatory engagement, Praxis created a statically valuable mm -hmm. environmental response with the long lasting plastic resources. So I temporarily hacked the canteen and connecting this notion of nature to the urban environment or bringing the nature to the urban environment. Mm -hmm. So, through this ontological design process of making with single-use plastics, I'm co-creating an aesthetic response that to slow environmental violence, representing mismanaged plastic waste narrative and visualizing plastic pollution. Some of these pieces are also um, pieces from some of my participatory events uh, across the UK and country. So it's been kind of interwoven and mixed with some of the natural um, elements. But one of these um, moments is that ultimate goal of praxis is to perceive the change from plastic waste as an undesired material externality to forging new relations of positive waste as aesthetic and relations to plasticized bodies of nature. And again, following Hillman, I posited of question of can there be an ethics without aesthetics or a new trash aesthetics or as I, through my praxis, calls it um, design disposal. So this new materiality becomes the outcome of a visionary aesthetic response and the visual narrative that through some interdisciplinary scientific engagement as well and data connects design, speculative design and research with open loop re reuse, fostering novel waste relations towards the nature relations or explores notions of uh, design research and nature, um, raising awareness of slow environmental violences um, and plastic pollution. And perhaps I am a little bit too quick. Do I have a little bit more? A couple of more minutes? Uh, we're at time. It's so fast. Is it done? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so then good on time. So that's all from me. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Katharina. Um, Wonderful. Uh, all right. So yes, these are so fast, and I think yeah, these are a, an an amuse bouche for yeah the, the main meal. So I would encourage all of you to follow up with their presenters, um, just because there is so much to cover in such a short amount of time. Um, next, we'll have Seda up. Okay. So I will present uh, our. Mapping, making a case for a mapping atmosphere by uh, me and my sister, Shayda Ostetsin. As I said, I'm a PhD student at IMA Institute of Design, uh, and I'm part of this Decode network, and my sister is from Hamida Design Studio. Um, so I will introduce a little bit like what we do in this Decode network, which is the Horizon 2020 Marie Curie uh, Innovative Training Network. Uh, we work uh, across five work packages in redesigning design for post-digital era, I would say. So we we look at uh, this shift to algorithms, interaction, value, governance, and ethics in design. And um, my PhD project, Designing Alternatives for the Terms of Service, falls into the governance package. And I think overall, uh, what is kind of uh, one of the key elements of this program is to uh, understand, um, unpack, and uh, try to find methodologies for designing uh, instead of one-to-one -one relations to one-to-many relations. So there comes to uh, systemic wheel, I would say. Um, 
So uh, my research, in addition to some the theoretical readings uh, about uh, design philosophy, uh, post-human theories and such, uh, also uh, it started with going behind the toggles and check boxes of terms of service. Um, so usually we just, uh, um, our interactions just end at the, I agree to terms of service thing, but I, I went behind it. And uh, so as a result, I did many readings of terms of service and accompanying policies. And uh, it was, this experience was quite informative, uh, but it was really uh, kind of difficult to get an overview of this, um, what, what these policies were mentioning, because uh, usually you start with one policy, but then they start to link to other policies. And so as a designer, uh, it kind of became natural for me to start taking notes of this thing. And, uh, and then I looked, I was like uh, making connections and oh my God, is this a map? <laughs> and um, so I started with these like really simple um, mappings, uh, which looked like um, organizational charts. Uh, so what I was doing was like, uh, whenever I see an actor mentioned, I was like putting it uh, on the map and I was trying to like group them and et cetera. And then in, in another iteration, I tried to layer these things, uh, like how certain policies was kind of the external uh, external policies and that kind of introduced to new policies. And so I tried different kinds of layering. And then I, I wanted to look at it from a journey perspective and how uh, actually you need to go through many policy ecosystems before you actually come to the application that you're using so it um, uh, then it introduces a time perspective as well and then i i tried another version where i looked at uh, distribution of actors and relations across geographies and um and uh, across companies so certain corporations were repeatedly coming into the ecosystem like google and apple whereas some others were just like uh they had less weight in the ecosystem. So uh, these mappings uh, helped me create an, a different understanding of terms of service. And so I, I proposed this shift from terms of service to Tosphere, which is a dynamic ecosystem of TOS and their accompanying policies from the service itself and the third party services distributed over corporations and continents bounded by local and international laws and regulations, which all together function as a protective layer around contemporary connected things, controlling access and actions. So this shift was quite um, uh, interesting. And if I think like uh, it opened up very, so many trajectories for me, but at the same time, I was also through these mappings, I was also um, bounded by the way they described the ecosystem. So what was absent from these policies remained absent. So uh, in another exploration, um, I tried something I would call um, Twitter with my sister, we tried this spatial mapping. So we used the relational mapping, uh, this, this one, as a starting point and then we went to the forest and tried to uh, use the forest as a as a landscape uh, of actors and uh, try to replicate or translate this 2d mapping into a 3d mapping uh, so this experience was quite interesting it was um the the con the contextualized nature of it was uh, so fascinating i i've never spent so much time in forest and um so it it kind of informed me what was uh, absent which was nature and natural resources so no one ever mentions these things in these policies and uh, and so it kind of shaped my phd project into designing alterns for the terms of service towards a shift not just to social contracts but to eco-social contracts um so uh, I think I can maybe answer more questions because my time is up. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Yeah, again, I and and I encourage you. Thank. I see Jorn. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right, but um, I think it encourage folks to ask questions in the chat as well. That's a a way that we can also mitigate the the just breakneck speed of each of these presentations. All right, so next up we have um, Joe Berry. So Joe, whenever you're ready, take it away. So um, this is about art science collaboration, a framework um, using play as a concept. 
So I'm going to go through it really quickly because I've got too many slides. So since 2010, I sought out life scientists to collaborate with because the methods we employ to create image are connected. We both use laser technology. I, at the time, made laser cut light boxes, which requires knowledge of light, optics and computer visualization methods. And I am fascinated by how I can use scientific image data innovatively. As a result, a central part of my practice has involved contributing to scientific research projects as one of the research team. And from this experience, I designed a framework to discover if and how an artist researcher can contribute to new methods of interdisciplinary approaches in advanced imaging and microscopy. Um, as you can see on screen, it's a four stage approach um, and it is underpinned by action research. So what is novel about it for me was the introduction of play um, because I wanted to test the value of play and playfulness as a concept to discover the consequences and implications of when an artist collaborates with positive, fast checking life scientists and conducts interpretive research of life science. So. So in this presentation, I'm going to discuss one case study I undertook at the Centre of Cellular Imaging in Sweden, um, in Gothenburg, um, and bringing insights from personal reflections of what interpretive artistic research and play may mean for scientific experimentation. It was a significant opportunity to work with professionals in biointerfaces on an international project using multiphoton microscopy to image deep samples of skin. I invest, investigated Solgonis's core imaging lab as an underutilized visually, cognitively, and technologically artist research research resource. I expanded my knowledge of advanced imaging and microscopic systems capabilities, computer visualization techniques, and software. The relational components of this research were achieved by collaborating with four researchers who shared their knowledge and facilitated experiential insights. My collaborators had never worked with an artist before and were curious about its impact. There was a perceived, perceived lack of awareness by scientists of play and playfulness as a productive activity within this professional scientific laboratory. Yet I noted how playfulness came through as scientists and artists adopted interdisciplinary methods of working. Um, Role playing and swapping roles, performing my duties as a pseudoscientist liberated this investigation beyond one way of understanding science. I adopted the role of scientists, shadowing and copying my colleagues, practices, and in addition, I asked them to swap roles and document me as I was um, performing the role of scientist. And I trained to operate and image deep samples on the multifoton microscope to measure two topical drugs viability on skin. The imaging method was utilized to image 250 micron deep samples. Um, as a novel microscopic process, a multi-photon microscopy evolved into a new visual instrument. I found the illumination of the, screen, of the image on screen enthralling, as for example, I observed the microscope traveling through an active, complex, living organism. Incredible visual discoveries were made, such as natural ultrafluorescence, radiant iridescent color, and supernatural views of structural detail, all recorded as stills, 3D videos, and multi-layered Z-stacks. I analyzed optical color, the impact of traveling through layers of skin, its structure, depth, and scale. I was able to comprehend scientific concepts um, such as excitation, diffraction, and fluorescence with greater clarity. I found it vital to be there during scientific studies to gather experiential knowledge and to call attention to the aesthetic elements of my collaborators' data. The dynamic motion of biological matter enabled me to reinvent visual conceptions that's expanding skin research dissemination um, outputs. In stage two, I concentrated on practice as a method to disrupt scientific image convention conventions. My intention was to come up with novel ways to visualize image data that went beyond empirical representation. 
I did this through testing how I could extend data by deploying place systematically to simulate and manipulate data. The scientific computer lab, um, I'll just play some of these, um, became a crucial space for inquiry. I was free to set my own agenda. I tested the parameters and variables of um, its software and data. I created novel data sets of magnified collagen and cross sketches, cross sections of skin with hair follicles. And this sparked a never ending testing process where I played instinctively, tactfully, and divergently with software tools. It's all going slow. I used a data bank of visual information to develop other practice based outputs. Practice based developments in the studio involved three approaches. First, a deductive semi systematic drawing technique was used to offset digital drawn uniformity. I focused on visual attributes of skin, such as scientific color, structural detail. I embarked on making inaccurate, obsessive drawings. It was an activity that led me to drift, make mistakes, generalize I drew, as I drew pixel level detail at a high magnification using a 0.75 point vector rectangle unfold outline. I realized I was focusing on purely scientific data, which is only one part of the narrative. At this point, I wanted to illuminate the scientific procedure to introduce film and photographic footage to focus on the experimental process, quirky actions and traits of various scientists. For this reason, I introduced experiential aspects of research into the 2D large scale, scale print and moving Im image work I was making. Um, my focus shifted from cellular form to incorporating, incorporating archive data, photos, film footage and audio, all used to widen the context of this research. For example, lab film experts were incorporated in film about skin. I began to see unpredictable, offbeat, surreal encounters and unusual sounds of different accents, Swedish, Spanish, Lithuanian, as examples of how play functions in this lab. Play as a concept became the bridge connecting my inner actuality with events happening in this lab as I located what I saw as playful. No. No. Playful <laughs> scenario. So we're at time. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. And there's, I assume that the the link with your paper will have more of the amazing videos and visuals. Yes. Okay. Great. And we'll, I think we'll come back in the in the Q and A for sure. Um, and uh, next up, uh, Peter is next up. Um. I have a side project called System Viz. I've been running it for about 12, 13 years. And the main goal is to improve the way in which we visualize systems, right? Um, and I just want to mention, just as a side note, that a longer version of this presentation, the one I gave in Washington, is available online. And it's completely annotated, so it has my script notes in it as well. So you're getting a, a really brief version of this. Um, and so I created this big poster um, that I'm calling that the anatomy of system notations. So what I did is I went and I looked at um, hundreds of system notations to kind of pull out what the, the core elements of that are. And I've, I'm kind of drawing an analogy to kind of uh, anatomy uh, of like, uh, that we normally think of when we talk about animals. So what are what are the types of bits and pieces that go into making a system notation to better kind of describe how a system works. So I 
Um, when I took a look at all these systems, a lot of them were very redundant. They they were just kind of different systems in name only, different notations in name only. And so what I did do is I found 70 notations that had that were either highly standard uh, in, in terms of their use across various sorts of system disciplines, um, or they had some sort of novel feature to them. And I pulled out uh, 65 different types of graphical device that can be used. And this this is intended to be kind of a resource. Uh, I'm My long-term intentions are to perhaps design a new notation style, but people can use this for whatever mapping techniques they, they prefer, right? It's kind of like a, a bit of a buffet of different types of, of methods. Um, so how did I gather all of these? It was just sort of like a, a long process of butterfly collecting over a period of six years. And um, so what am I talking about when I'm talking about um, a networking diagram, uh, a, a net, a notation? It's usually something like a network diagram, which is the most common thing, which has nodes and links, sometimes kind of containers. It can also be, in, include system stacks, which are more of kind of um, almost like cells with the, the abutting edges suggesting interaction between parts of the system. Um, and if we break this down as an information designer would, you'd find that there's like semantic encoding. So certain things are present, given certain meanings. Composition rules, so how these things are fit together in order to kind of aid sense making. But also the spatial arrangements themselves are what is often called syntactics, also suggests a particular type of meaning um, that, that's very glanceable, right? And so as a result, we've got lots of these kind of general notations such as concept maps and Petri maps that can apply to any sort of um, discipline, but also a large number of highly specialized notations as well that like, uh, for things like um, neuroanatomy and and, bios and and microbiology and things like that. So I was wondering, like, how do I go about describing like 65 different kind of uh, graphic devices? And I thought, well, that would be really boring to kind of go through the whole poster. But what I did do was then think, well, maybe I can group these and use a playful theme. And so I used the theme of of sailing to kind of help organize some of these some of these devices. So the first one is just sort of node shape. So nodes just come in different types of shapes, different types of sizes to kind of uh, indicate almost a kind of a, a hierarchy. There are certain types of marks and uh, line styles and things like that that you can kind of differentiate them. Uh, so the first thing is I've, it's almost like the flotation devices that come in various different shapes and sizes. Um, the next one are, are what I call node complications that are kind of like the complications on a nautical watch face, right? And I'm hoping that terms like watch complication or node complications to actually kind of catch on within the discourse around this, because I think it's kind of a handy way of thinking, but how you can kind of um, add information to nodes. And as you can see here, there are lots of different types of parts of the node that can be used to overlay badges or add little ports or add labels and so forth. So to provide an example, like you might have a, a warehouse that's kind of a node that's kind of an image, but then you can overlay and underlay different bits of information or have these proximate uh, marks that are nearby, or you can have these little flags that overlap, and this sort of thing, right? Um, um, Node complexes are ones in which they you find that nodes are kind of grafted onto each other in, in these kind of um, more elaborate sort of centers. Um, and this the, the term comes from biology where this type of device is used a lot. And I kind of make a comparison to things like luggage trolleys. Uh, so here are some examples where you can kind of nest within certain nodes within other nodes, or you can kind of have um, nodes is having little kind of groups or clusters. Um, but also you can segment the nodes into different kind of regions and the different regions inside the node can have different types of information. So I think of this as kind of like the the, the modular luggage. Um, um, links can also have complications as well. You can overlay badges, you can have multiple link ends, so like double arrows or things like that. You can 
have objects running along the length of links. You can have symbolic shapes and so forth. So here are some examples of like highly ornate forms of links where you have different types of information about what the relationship between different nodes is, what the nature of it is, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there are all sorts of different ways in which um, links branch and and merge and, and things like that, how they how they interact. You can have things like little detours. Um, you can kind of bracket portions of a link. You can have special symbols related to merging or joints or things like that, uh, which are kind of like the rigging blocks that you find in the sailing ships. And, and then there are sort of contextual um, information that kind of provide an indication of not just um, what type of relations are happening between entities within a map, but also what's what are the contexts within which those take place? So you can have containers or dividers. Um, there are very co more com complicated types of uh, graphic that sh will show things like um, decomposition blocks that show different levels of scale or toggle uh, to um, disclosure toggles that will reveal nodes within nodes within nodes as kind of part whole relationships of, of systems. So that's kind of the that's kind of like the overview. This is what the whole poster looks like. Um, it's available for download uh, both on the RSD site, but also at the systemviz.com site. And you can kind of take a look at that. It's all open source, so use as you see fit for fun profit. And thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um... Yeah, and as a side note, I, I reached out to Peter earlier this year asking if I could get a printed copy of that poster because I, I find it so compelling. So um, that was wonderful. Thank you all so much. I'm, I'm, yeah, just like I love the variety and the depth of of what you've shared. Um, and and now Sally has um, the the task of just giving a little bit of it, like I, Sally, I'm so curious to hear what what you're seeing in terms of just pulling out threads that um, many of us might have seen. And then we'll have a, a broader discussion after Sally is able to, to give a little bit of, of her take on things. So Sally, take it away. Okay, so right on cue, I've started coughing a little bit. So if I do carry on, then I'll uh, just I'll just stop. We'll talk amongst I'll ourselves. In the chat. But fingers crossed. Okay, so I think, yeah, I mean, there's so many fascinating overlaps there and um, really significant differences. I think for me, especially the first three projects, I guess um, they present quite um, kind of more than rational methodolog methodological approaches, I guess, to um, to explore and understand different contexts, which I think I really, really enjoyed. Um, and that's quite different from a lot of traditional or standard approaches in systemic design. Um, and I think those as, as presentations, they were incredibly beautiful. Um, I think all the projects are um, really demonstrate the way that design research can zoom in and out. And I think taking that in a kind of unmapping context, um, the way that they can um kind of move around and be viewed from lots of different angles like i know we it was kind of mentioned in the intro to this to this session but the fact that you know these are projects that can then be looked at in many many different ways um i think is a really fantastic thing that we bring as creative quick creative practitioners and practice based design researchers as well um the all, all of them are incredibly beautiful, but I'm, I'm, I'm mostly curious. Or I was very curious about the way that um, the more than visual ways were used. So when audio became involved or the video, um, and I think I really like the gestures or the the conversations or this kind of interaction and the overlaps in Joe's videos that I'd be really curious to see more of, and. Um, and the the kind of movement of the paper and the trees and um um and this kind of um the way that you can kind of really touch or connect with um Katarina's um Kwadi 
Kraldi. Is that right? <laughs> um, work. Um, I think um, what is fascinating as well is how the kind of more than visual approaches are med kind of mediate the relationships and the knowledge making between um, researchers from different disciplines and non-expert audiences. So I'd love to know a bit more about that, specifically thinking about the more than visual um, elements. Um, and I'm then kind of going on to the um, systems viz, which is really fascinating and an amazing resource. It's not the way I work in terms of being incredibly kind of um, rational and very uh, concise. Um, but the graphically it's presenting an amazing tool um and there's something about looking at the symbols and the kind of when i look at them they kind of get a bit blurry for me and they kind of um dance around a little bit and i wonder how um that might be to do with neurodivergence um but i'm interested in you know they um they they kind of like keys on a map and i wonder how much you do even need to understand them um, or how we can use them in ways that are, where we're not necessarily understanding them, everything about them, but they tell us something. Um, and uh, you really get a feel for something by using that. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know a bit more about that from Peter. And uh, get, going back to Joe's, I guess play fit, felt like it was an incredibly fundamental part of all those projects. Um, and I know for me, play is really important in my own practice based research. And especially in COVID, I didn't have a chance to play. I found that incredibly difficult um, and it really, really restricted my own practice. So it'd be great to know a bit more about um, how we can better value play within systemic design um, and how, how important that is to all of you. Um, because it did feel like that really tied all of the work together. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I've got for you. That's a, a a wonderful prompt, and I think a, a tilling of the soil. I'd love for yeah anyone, like of the kind of uh, presenters, if you want to share any thoughts about what Sally's just mentioned, because yeah, I had similar thoughts about just like the idea of play and aesthetics all coming together in different ways. So yeah, any responses from the presenters? Um, I can I can quickly just offer a few rapid fire responses. One is I I am um, my project also involves things like um, motion and animation and things like that. I just want to kind of mention as part of one of the tranches of my research because the I um, as I mentioned in the in the Washington presentation where I want to also take this is to create uh, uh, forms of notation that work better with the modern media that are more interactive and more 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 animated and things like that so uh, expect more from me on that front i'm i've been actively researching that that area as well um on the on the topic of um neurodivergence there's it's it's interesting because one of the challenges here is that you'll whenever you're trying to visualize something you'll you'll always have a certain percentage of the population who um don't think of themselves as visual thinkers and therefore um, it might not be a very good match. The usual way in which I kind of deal with this in my practice is uh, as an information designer, it tends to be to create different types of channels with through which people prefer to receive information, whether it be an audio channel uh, or a textual um, or something that's a little bit more visual. Like you have people like who have things like uh, aphantasia, for example, who can't picture things in the mind's eye. But in the same time, having a device like this sort of mapping technique um, might be an aid to them as well. So there's that. But you're you're quite right about the the problem of things like symbols creating a certain type of overload, right? Because it it literally takes some in some cases years for people to learn the symbols for something like uh, electrical diagrams, uh, which will have hundreds of different types of symbols to them. Um, and that's kind of why I want, that's why I aspire to create a notation that tries to 
work across various sorts of disciplines while also not being too overwhelming, while also being more into maybe a little bit more intuitive and reducing the learning curve. Um, and one of the methods in which I'm I'm advocating, because uh, this notation I want to have, I want it to be quote unquote opinionated in the way in which software engineers use the word opinionated, which is that it it makes some arguments as to what could possibly work better. And the argument that I'm putting forth is that there there can be a real opportunity to take from things like infographics and other forms of very pictorial ways of describing things and making the nodes more pictorial as opposed to abstract symbolic. Uh, and in order to kind of show, don't tell uh, when it comes to what a system is, because quite often we don't have a lot of firsthand interaction with parts of a system that are either too big or too small. Uh, like, for example, the workings of, a, of an animal cell, for example, we don't really understand. But if you can actually show people give it some sort of iconogra iconographic um, 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 uh, iconographic meaning to it, then that, that helps. And on this point, I'll just quickly mention that last uh, May, I presented a paper on a, another project related to, uh, it's on the system biz site, which is called Escalade, which is an information design framework for working through that problem. So that I presented in Vienna in May. If um, if that's right, I would like to perhaps if you have a bit of a time to kind of comment back or reconnect to the first three uh, projects of Joe Berry, Sedas and Crowley and the notion of play. One of the interesting things that goes beyond um, infographics or two-dimensional two or animated realm of design narration is there is a space and place context that connects to the nature uh, post-humanist notion um, and that type of repetition and playfulness with materiality, um, with the body tissue, um, with contractual kind of systemic ways of looking um, and positing uh, things in kind of a determinant manner in a forest, um, in a lab, um, uh, to bringing trash um, and rubbish um, um, and pollution um, to the cafeteria, to the urban spaces. Um, and as you say yourself, Sally, it was really um, difficult uh, this notion of playfulness uh, through the COVID, where we could not um, participatory engage um, in action research that is particular to Crowd D, uh, where I start being a playful with the nature, with the tree, with the materiality conversations. Um, and I think that is the interesting point where this mapping uh, or systemic way of observation becomes a spatial context, almost like a vortex, um, and has a certain combinations of nature, cosmologies, um, our inner systems, our inner bio biological structures. Um, yeah, so, so that is also kind of a way of looking at certain nodal points from the feminist, post-feminist point of views as well, how we can connect um, and how then that playfulness can bring us to the notions of care. Yeah, and, and I think that, that um, there's a comment from Sylvie, and, and we can shift uh, towards opening this up for questions from, from the audience, but the, um, Sylvie talks about the idea of mapping in the forest in a beautiful one. It resonates with me as I see the need for more embodied wisdom in the systemic design um, process. And, and Sylvie's question is for Sedes, uh, did you find this allowed you to tap into your intuition felt or non-cognitive knowing about the system, which I think to me gets at the heart of some of your work, Sedes. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think... Um... I think mapping in the in the 2D environment was like kind of stressful and I, I always felt like it needs to be accurate and this and that kind of thing. And even like I didn't do mapping from systems perspective actually. I didn't use any systems theories and such. So I don't even know the terminology well. Uh, 
uh, but like I was trying to make sense of it, you know, from my perspective. But when I shifted to the forest, I think it was like more, it kind of um, evolved into more intuitive experience and the accuracy uh, was no longer that important. It was more like a experiential and artistic, I would say. And uh, I think like we spent like two days in the forest doing this thing. And we real we noticed all the natural cycles in the forest. So the sunrise and then the sun sun goes down. And so heat changes, the light changes. And so you're like, oh, I need to stop. Or it is at times very windy and these policies can't stand and they fall down and etc. So it was like so much in tune with nature. And that's how I realized that actually they were absent in these policies. So that um, that was quite an interesting revelation. revelation. And the fact that we were like uh, kind of disbelonging to this environment, uh, both ourselves, because like we were kind of clumsy, uh, there's a bug and etc. you know, like we don't belong there. And also all these papers don't belong there and we created a mess. Um, so it kind of made us think about our, um, impact on nature and how these technologies, even though rely on uh, natural resources and energies and etc., we we don't really recognize their agency and we don't really, uh, we're not accountable for its impact. So all these things kind of like came through this like embodied performative experience that I didn't uh, envision at the beginning, you know, these kind of um, outcomes. I don't know if answers that's, the question. <laughs> that's incredible. What a yeah, what an inspiring kind of sight and and outcome. Um, other other questions from the audience. I would say if you uh, either type it in the chat or use the raise hand function, and we'll call on you. Uh, Goran. Yeah, well, well, thank you all so much for these wonderful presentations. A question that I have um, is is around what might you have learned or gleaned through expanding these practices in mapping, and how might they have affected you and and your own research? Who wants to take it? It's a good one. Joe, you want to? Can I put you on the spot? <laughs> yeah, sure then. Um, how might I take it to do with mapping? I think I map information. I've been thinking about it quite a lot, actually. How I digest information. And, you know, like when people give you a large data set of information, big data files, I just find it too overwhelming. So, what I need to do to understand and map information. Uh, is to actually take it back to maybe just being very selective about what I choose to look at for a start and really think about individual pieces of information to map information from. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm an artist, an artist researcher, so I am always trying to think about novel ways to visualise information. Uh, and map information and this idea of unmapping works because I think it's the idea of a, maybe a Dada aesthetic where um, you know like it's important to have rules and then bend rules and break rules and remap information to show new information so I think part of my practice is about reinterpretation and uh, revisualizing things that are maybe already out there or and also trying to navigate it as a an individual person rather than to um so so how do I do that what are my strategies to do that as an artist as a researcher and and, and uh, as a person who is um mapping information but in a maybe an unconventional way <laughs> does that answer the question yeah, thanks very much. Does anyone else want to weigh in? Burns question. I don't mind expanding a little bit about the notion of uh, mapping and unmapping or learning and unlearning, and particularly um, through, through my own uh, praxis, um, 
which which became almost egalitarian connection to the nature, but also connection of materiality within me and the embodiments. Um, it was one of the ways of um, this type of a mapping explorations, uh, which was speculative, uh, but also theoretical, but also hands-on as well, of um, un unrevealing this kind of entangled political systems of services, and particularly um, I'm looking at waste management services beyond just recycling. Um, so looking at um, discard beyond just disposal, um, um, toxicologies, the scales, um, politics of matter, um, and finding this intuitive um, art and design interdisciplinary scientific way to emerge and combine this in a playful way because these are also uh, quite complex uh, super wicked topics looking from the social sciences point of view but also looking from some echo anxieties that we all share on a global level um, so th this was one of the ways to um, tackle you know, with a teaspoon, a bit of a, a chunk of the iceberg. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, other question. I want to, yeah, just I, I want to give time for other questions if there are some. I know there's, and there's active chat as well. But yeah, any? Yes, uh, Angelisa, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much, everyone. I really enjoyed this. And Joe, I had a special question for you in terms of, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I'm wondering what the impacts were to your colleagues uh, when they were working with you. Were there any learnings or were they like, oh, we got to change this process or yeah, was there anything like that? Yeah, there, there were lots of things like, um, so they use a specific language like art and designers use a specific language and we had to come up with a way of communicating with each other that we understood each other so there was a obviously have to understand their scientific processes from a lay person's point of view so we learned we also when I collaborate with people it's not just about learning about the science or learning about what they do it's learning about them as people their lives, <laughs> you know, their families, what what they what they like to do, and actually, I think it's like the is the the complementary. Um, I, I think the one thing that we all we have in common when I'm working with scientists is that the people I'm working with are really interested in imaging. I'm interested in imaging, and that is the commonality. So we have this working knowledge of image from a very different perspective, and I think what we learn from each, each other is how we look and interpret and view image and that's a really key cornerstone for our development as you know like as we develop our collaborative relationships with each other but it is about mutual respect and it is about um learning from each other and i think that is the common platform that's why it works if that makes sense Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, all right. So we have time for like one more, a quick question and a quick answer. <laughs> Anybody? I'm just going to call on Marie, who I know does a lot of this crossover work, maybe for a final comment. I, I'm sort of bursting for you to say something, Marie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this feels like it's very much in your <laughs> in your wheelhouse, and I thought you might like to sing us out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I would like to say that uh, I really enjoyed the presentations, and uh, I very much enjoyed that. Uh, you know, this is giving this uh, this session is giving different perspectives to mapping, which uh, takes it uh, out of the board and table and. Uh, start doing something special, which is uh, which can be very valuable for systemic design. So I, I believe uh, that uh, we should all try to try to update our mapping with uh, with more of such actions uh, 
I recently had fantastic experience with Elena Porkedu, where we uh, integrated the the field works into into our mapping events. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm very much into that, and it was very inspiring. Thank you very much to all. Yeah, I agree. I think it's um, yeah, it's just so wonderful for all of you to be here and to like both to kind of share the the insights that have come from the presenters and the just the attention and and presence of the attendees. I think this is tremendous. Thank you, Cheryl, um, and thank you all for being here. I think this is one of those great ways where this community can just kind of keep the momentum going in between the different kind of more major conferences. So I'm so grateful for y'all to be here and Cheryl for organizing and we will share